morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church this morning. It's a beautiful Palm Sunday um, and we want to welcome you. I'm going to start off with the announcements first. Um, the reason Sydney is at our piano is because when she turns the organ on, we have a pipe that wants to do a solo. So, um, <laughs> so it's uh, doing its own thing and so we're going to have to um, see about getting our organ fixed. Um, as you said, we're starting Holy Week this week, and um, I don't know if you all are familiar with the songwriter and musician Dallas Holmes, but he wrote a beautiful composition called Rise Again. So on Friday, um, if you think about it, uh, go to YouTube and just listen to the words uh, that he has written about uh, Good Friday. And in our theology at five, we are doing um, a really neat study, and we're using uh, the writer uh, using ordinary objects like shoes and oil, and and then this week um, we're going to be doing the cross and the thorns. And uh, in one of her in one of her little uh, days, her daughter says, "I don't know why they call it Good Friday." said that's just not right because of Christ being crucified on the cross and, and that it's just not good. There's not, not anything good about it. And, and her mother said, yes, that it's called Good Friday because of the hope that we have that's going to come on Sunday morning. And uh, so uh, during this, and then on Thursday evening at 6 o'clock at Covenant, we will have our Monday Thursday service and we will join them and we would love to have you uh, join us with that. Um, we'd also like to have anyone to join us on Sunday mornings at 9.45 for Sunday school. Um, we, the lessons are great uh, by Keith and Ann. They alternate and uh, give us really in-depth study of the scripture for the next week. And so we'd love to have you to come and join us with that. Are there any joys, concerns, or announcements? I have one more announcement. Okay. Um, on Saturday, March, or May the 14th, um, we are, um, the Fair on the Square is happening, and it's put on by Jacksonville Arts Council, and so what we at First Press are going to do is um, have a tent that uh, we're going to be doing a free craft, free art, for the children. So I would love for you to come. It starts at 9 o'clock. We need volunteers uh, to come, and anyone can help with the art. Um, project with the, with the kids and I think it's just a great way for us to connect with our community and give something that is just really good um, and fun. So please join us May 14th at 9 a.m. How did your uh, session go yesterday with your painting? Oh, Covenant? it was great. Um, we've been doing uh, over at Covenant, Church of the Covenant um, Linton art um, projects with uh, people over there and it's just been really great to connect and um, think about the Linton season in a new uh, way visually with, um, with art and just practice in our own creativity and we are doing them here as well um, in the coming months so please um, I assume there's an email list uh, that things come out to please come they're free um, art classes uh, that are put on by me and again they're free anyone can come and do it we'd love for you to, to join us Oh, um, Laura's got something. Oh, I'm sorry, Laura. Has a moment. I just want to share a message um, for a moment for mission for our one great hour of sharing special offering that is today. <clears throat> what, what if there, these were the days where Jesus was living with us? What if this were the moment God chose to connect? Where would we find Jesus? Here in our congregation or in our neighborhoods? Perhaps Jesus would be among people classified as essential, who might struggle to feed their own families while ensuring food makes it to others' tables. Perhaps Jesus would be working in a neighborhood, mostly ignored by government and industry, except when there are resources to be exploited or removed. Perhaps Jesus lives in any of these places, so impoverished in a world of plenty that help and hope seem like illusions. Or perhaps locked away, drowned out, or disregarded so far from us that we never even know our Savior's name. What if this is the time? What if this is the place? Our faith proclaims that God connects in each of those places and in each person's bearing 
God's image. Our faith proclaims that God is among us and that Jesus can be found among those most precious to, to God. Those neighbors experiencing hunger, oppression, or lack, even now, even among us. One great hour of sharing connects us with people coming together to respond to the needs in their neighborhoods. It is the largest way Presbyterians connect with one another and unite with congregations in every corner of the church and with partners all over the world. We connect in order to grow together while offering support that addresses shared needs in a particular context. With God and with, other, with one another, we connect to the story of Jesus who lived healed, and preached among those who had least during his earthly ministry. Those through ministry that seek healing and wholeness in our world today. One great hour of sharing connects us to proclaim that Christ is here. God is with us. Jesus is among those who have least, those who hunger and thirst, those who are sick or alone, with those seeking justice and righteousness, with their neighbors and all who are in need. Christ is here and not here alone. When we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. Let us pray. To connect us with our need, connect us with our offerings, connect us through the gift of our love and your love for all you have created. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
join me in our call to worship. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us together now read the prayer of confession. 
Holy God, sure of your faithfulness, even in your dying, comforted by your compassion toward your people in every age, we seek your mercy with an imperfect gratitude. We have sought personal favor rather than your kingdom. We have withheld from your people, our neighbors, and from your creation, our earth, the care and tending they deserve. We have rejected the cornerstone you sent to build a people of righteousness. Forgive our failings. Heal what we have broken. Nurture what we have neglected. And lead us to your vision so that we may know the peace of salvation through you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. forgiven, we are redeemed, and we are made new. Amen. Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> and now our first reading comes from Luke 19, 28 through 40. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he came near Bethage in Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter, it you will find tied there a coat that has never been written. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had been told. As they were untying the coat, his owners asked them, why are you untying the coat? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the coat, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. And as he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Friends, I'm going to read Psalm 118, but the sermon this morning is coming from the Luke passage. Uh, so I will just read Psalm for us and then go from there. O 
Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected have become the chief cornerstone. That this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that Lord, the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. We have traveled far this Lenten season. For the past six weeks, we have read about Jesus' teachings and healings. We have listened to the same age-old story. And yet, I believe, we have uncovered new meanings of what the Lenten journey means in today's world. And here we are, again this morning, on this Palm Sunday, preparing ourselves for this turning point in this holy story. Now the lectionary drops us right smack dab in the middle of Luke 19. In the midst of a pivotal moment, we're given just a teaser in the beginning of our scripture passage, alluding to something Jesus had said in previous verses. So what did Jesus say? Why did Luke find it important to connect what Jesus had said to his journey to Jerusalem? And he says, after he had said this in verse 28, he had went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And if we turn back to the verses before verse 28, we learn that Jesus is actually traveling through Jericho. And he's got quite the crowd. He encounters Zacchaeus, a fraudulent and wealthy tax collector, tax collector, and spends time at his house and gives him salvation after Zacchaeus vows to give half of his possessions to the poor and pay back all the people he had defrauded. In Zacchaeus' house, Zacchaeus' house, Jesus goes on to tell this parable because, and Luke says, because he was near Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. Luke writes in verse 11. So I, I think that this means that the people were probably, the people that were around Jesus probably were expecting something to happen when Jesus got into Jerusalem. So Jesus does what he does best, and he tells a parable. And he speaks of this nobleman in, in verse uh, 12, he, who, this nobleman has left behind enslaved people to care for his business. Luke writes in verse 12 of a nobleman's journey to secure royal power for himself in a distant country. We do not learn much about the specifics of this journey, except that the citizens of the land hated him. And they challenged his rule. Luke writes in verse 14. But we learn at the end of the story that just because these people hated this noble ruler, just because they didn't like him, didn't change the fact that he ruled over them anyway. And this parable actually ends in verse 27, saying, and this is the ruler saying to the people, 
But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and slaughter them in my presence. Those were the words. That was the story of a king who was hungry for power and willing to do whatever it took to maintain that power. This story is of a king who killed anyone who objected his rule. This is the story of a king who wielded his power for his own profit and his own gain. This is the story Jesus lets linger in the air as he turns and heads toward Jerusalem. Jesus turns and walks away after he says those, those words to these people around him. And he begins his descent into Jerusalem. And that's where we find ourselves this morning at the beginning of. Scripture tells us that Jesus instructed two disciples to go into town, find a coal that had never been ridden, untie it, and bring it back to him. They did exactly as they were instructed and brought the colt back to him. They found it exactly how Jesus had laid it out. And then Luke writes, they throw their cloaks onto the colt. Jesus sat on it and began riding down the mountain into Jerusalem. And this crowd was still traveling with him. And so they started putting their cloaks on the road, <clears throat> putting palms on the road, waving palms, and shouted joyfully songs of praise to the king. To anyone of that time, this scene loosely resembles a typical Roman procession of a triumphant king who was returning home from victorious, probably violent, battle. Except this king, our Jesus, is not riding in a four-horse elaborate chariot like a Roman military king, like the king in the parable. No, this king is riding in on a little, never ridden before cult. This king is not Roman. Jewish. And this king is not known for his violent destruction, but for his healing. It's no wonder the Pharisees disapprove of what was happening. This looked like it was directly undermining, undermining the Roman authority, and the, it looked like it was going to be the beginning of an uprising. Perhaps the Pharisees were scared of attracting all that attention and causing harm to the multitudes of Jews who had come to Jerusalem for this Passover celebration. And as we understand this scripture passage, as we try to imagine, can you just feel the intensity of the moment? This crowd of people must have witnessed, perhaps even benefited from, the miracles Jesus had performed, the lessons that he taught, the lives he changed for the better. They must have experienced the message of the first will be last and the last will be first. They must have experienced the blessings that he bestowed. They were the poor, the weak, the hungry. They were the homeless, the forgotten, the outcast. They must have been there to see the power of God in human form being used to turn the unjust and unfair power structure on its head. So, they shouted. They rejoiced. They used their voices loudly to proclaim the good news of peace and glory. They praised God joy joyfully. Luke writes, for all the deeds of power that they have seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And the Pharisees wanted them to stop. They ordered Jesus to make them stop. And yet, Jesus simply replies, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Here is a faith in the sure triumph of God. 
Here is a prophetic assurance that injustice will not long prevail, prevail, that God's power surpasses any earthly human power possesses. Excuse me. Any earthly power human kings possess. And so the people joyously shout and welcome their king into Jerusalem with hopes that Jesus is moments away from leading a rebellion against Rome. We know that did not happen. We know that in a few days' time, blessed is the king will be replaced with crucify him. He will be named king of the Jews, not out of honor, but mockery. We know that Jesus will experience extreme torture and be nailed to a cross and die a painful death. And perhaps Jesus knew all this. Perhaps he thought he, he could see it coming, right? Um, they, had, they had been wanting to kill him for, for some time now. And as he rode that little colt down into Jerusalem, perhaps he caught glimpses of the betrayal and torture and death. Maybe he knew that the palms in the air, the cloaks on the road, the people praising him were all but a brief moment before everything changes. And despite everything, the fear, the political unrest, the looming death, the betrayal, everything, he still allowed the crowd to joyously praise God for the liberation they felt in that moment. And as he said, because if they didn't, the stones would have done it for them. My hope on this Palm Sunday is that this Lenten journey for you and I has been filled with life, death, and resurrection, and it emboldens us to shout out our praises to God for all of God's power we have seen. My hope is that we are empowered today in 2022, that we are empowered to use our own voices to loudly proclaim justice in an unjust world, that we are empowered to offer love instead of hatred and judgment. And that we redistribute wealth and power so that all may live a dignified life. My hope is that our voices are so loud that we can't hear them telling us to stop. But yet if we do, in the moments that we are unable, to shout, to sing praises, to dance, to wave palms, to put cloaks on the road, if we are unable, please know the stones would fill that void. When you came in this morning, you were handed a stone. If you didn't get a stone, please let us know and we'll get one to you. If you would, take your stone and hold it in your hands. Feel its smooth texture. Feel its bumps and, and ridges. Feel the weight of it. The way that gravity pulls it down into your hand. Look at it. Look at all the colors and the layers that are formed in this rock. Of all the rocks in this room, of all the rocks in this world, you are the only one that has this particular rock. There is no other rock like the one you hold in your hand. Ponder with me a moment, will you? Let's imagine that we are in the crowd of people praising Jesus as he rides into Jerusalem. And you can close your eyes if you'd like. What do you see? As
as we stand in the crowd of people, as we stand in this commotion, what do you see? Do you see the multitude of people huddled together along the road for miles? What do you feel? Are you touching the garments being laid on the road? Does your hand momentarily stroke the colt as it rides by, or even Jesus? Are you holding the palms? Are you waving them as they walk? What do you smell? Perhaps you smell the colt as it walks by. Or maybe even you catch a wafting scent the visceral smell of being among a crowd of people. Perhaps you smell the fresh mountain air on your face. What do you hear? Do you hear the shouts? <clears throat> do you hear the praises? Do you hear the Pharisees? Perhaps you are shouting yourself. What deeds of power have you seen in your life? What gospel truth must you share with the world so boldly? Perhaps you feel something stir inside you, and it compels you to lift your voice. And once you speak your praise once, you realize that you must speak it louder, bolder, even more robust. And someone does beg you to stop. Friends, I ask you in this moment, the stone you hold in your hand, if you were unable to shout praises to God, what would this stone cry out in your place? What word, what word or words of truth would your stone cry out if you were unable to voice them? to God. Now, if you would like, I would love for you to turn to your neighbor and tell them what word or words of truth, of praise you would, your stone would say in your absence. If you don't have a neighbor, there'll be time after you can share as well. <laughs> Jesus didn't just talk about one stone. Jesus didn't talk about one person. Jesus talked about a multitude of disciples. Jesus used the word stones, which is plural. We are Jesus' disciples. There are stones for us. And as we share together this life, this Lenten season, this Palm Sunday, the Easter story as we live it, may you know you're not alone 
and that together we are stronger and better as a community of believers. And that your truth is not like anyone else's truth, just like your stone is not like any other stone. And I, I pray that you are emboldened to speak your truth more loudly because that is the truth God has given you. And as we approach Good Friday that's not so good, may we hope in this day and age, that we hope the same hope that was found on resurrection morning. Let us pray. Holy God, we stand here, we sit here together with our stones. We know that you made this stone and that you made us. We know that you are calling us as disciples of Jesus as we are in the crowd waving palms and, and shouting, blessed is the King. We know that you have put in us the ability to shout. And so we do. We shout our truth. We shout about your love. And we share it with others. And even when we are tired or we can't or someone asks us to stop shouting, we pray that our stones, our little stones, will speak for us. We ask in your name to hold us and to guide us as we travel and remember the death, the burial, and the glorious resurrection comes on.
read together the affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. so on. Let's pray. O Lord our God, we bring you the needs of our world, broken by division, by hatred and war. We bring you the needs of our land, the hungry and homeless, the wounded and despairing. We bring you the needs of ourselves and our loved ones, seeking your peace, your will, your healing, your wisdom and protection. Lord, we pray for Beverly and Linda. We pray for Martha and Alston. We pray for Chuck and Sherry Lynn. We pray for Charlie and we pray for Shaler. We pray for Carol Hill and Carol Martin. We pray for Alyssa and Rocky Stamen. God, we, we lift up Linda and Chap. God, we pray for Ryan and Kathleen and Evan. Lord, we pray for this congregation. We pray for those who are unable to be with us. We pray for our community and those beyond it. We pray for those in our state we pray for people at Living River and the people that we touch there. We pray for our country. We pray for those who are not able to have food. We pray for the immigrants who are coming here, desperately searching for a safe place. God, we pray for those in Ukraine as they continue to fight the battle of evil against evil, God. And, and we pray for those people who are displaced from Ukraine, and we pray for all of those who have found it in their hearts to go and help. Hear us, O oh God, and come to us in compassion and love, rescue and restore our people, and make us in your gentle reign. Amen. Amen. Let us pray as our Father has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now turn to our offering. A generous God calls for us to live generous lives. Let us take a moment to bless our tithes and offerings to further Christ's mission and ministry.
and you can share the love of Christ with others. Take the stone, and may it be a reminder that even when you can't do all of those things, that the stones will do it for you. May it be so. Amen.